We'll begin our, pre our presentation for this morning. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the session, what every older adult and caregiver needs to know about the COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, we're delighted that you've taken the time to join us today. We know this is a very important topic for many. Uh, it's with great hope and uh, expectation that our society awaits uh, their vaccination. And uh, we're really happy to celebrate uh, those who've already been able to receive this. So this presentation is hosted by the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy. My name is Don Wildfong and I'm the implementation facilitator for the strategy. So I welcome you here today, those of you who have joined us as participants on this beautiful spring morning. Uh, today we're, we're, uh, we have, we'll be recording the session uh, that, and this will be shared uh, following the following today's session, probably early next week with you. Uh, just so those of you at home know, you are not uh, on screen. So it's only those of us who are here as presenters whose faces will appear on the screen. Um, we are at inviting you to share your questions in the question and answer section uh, that you see on your platform in the bottom tray, it should say Q&A. So we'll take questions and comments following the presentations. So, Today we're gathered here to talk about uh, and learn more about how vaccines work and what the vaccines are, what have been approved in Canada and what other vaccines may be coming. We're going to hear more about some of the contraindications or precautions of these vaccines and their potential side effects. And we're going to learn more about the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines and who is eligible uh, to receive the vaccine right now. To help us do that, we're joined by uh, special guests today and presenters, and I'll, I'll quickly introduce them right now uh, in advance of their presentations. So we're joined by Dr. Kelly Grindrod. Uh, Kelly is uh, a, a, PhD, a doctor in pharmacology uh, with the Ontario College of Pharmacists. She's a professor in the pharmacy innovation and associate in pharmacy innovation and an associate professor with the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Dr. Sharon Ball, is a primary is the primary care lead for Cambridge North Dumfries uh, with the Waterloo Wellington Lynn and the COVID nine COVID nineteen regional non hospital lead for Waterloo Wellington during the pandemic uh, as part of the Ontario Health West region. Kylie Anderson is a liaison officer for COVID nineteen response and health promotion specialist with the Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health. And Fazia Bag is the equity and anti racism advisor. Uh, with the Equity, Inclu Equity, Inclusion and Human Rights Unit uh, at the Chief Administrator's Office at the Region of Waterloo. And Fozzi has been um, very involved in community engagement in Waterloo Region as it relates to the vaccines. So we'll, we'll go consecutively through the presentations. Uh, we know that you'll learn a lot this morning and we'll take questions following uh, all of the presentations. One last thing, the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy is a 10-year plan a uh, comprehensive plan to support the aging of, a pop of our population across Waterloo Wellington and optimize the health system that supports them and their caregivers. So without further ado, we'll move forward with the presentation from Dr. Kelly Greenrod. Thank you very much. Now these slides that I use are uh, part of a partnership with a number of people from across Canada of uh, infectious disease physicians, primary care physicians, pharmacists, nurses, uh, trying to help people feel more comfortable with the vaccines and, and get their questions answered. Uh, next slide, please. So there's three main things I'm gonna to review today. The first is to help you understand how the mRNA and viral vector vaccines work, to review the COVID-19 vaccines that are approved right now in Canada, and then the other ones that should be coming or could be coming, and then review contraindications and precautions of these vaccines and their side effects. Next slide, please. So I love updating this slide. I, every time I do one of these presentations a day or two before, I, I update the slide and I actually just noticed in the top corner, you can see where we started. I should have updated that. It says over 2 million. Well, now we're at almost 6 million as of uh, looking at this list this morning. It was slow going for a long time. It was slow in December and January and February. And now, I mean, it, every time I check every week or so, it's going up by a million people. If you notice along the left hand side, um, the numbers of, of even each individual province, you know, some provinces are approaching a million, Ontario is over 2 million people vaccinated now. And if we look at the map, one thing you'll notice is the proportion of people. And again, when we started this, it was one, two, 3%, and we hung out there for a long time. 
Now it's increasing quite a bit. Ontario's got 8% of its population now with at least their first dose. Uh, early on, the Northwest Territories, Yukon, Nunavut were prioritized because they have, uh, it's difficult for people who get COVID up there to access care. We often have to airlift them out. So we preferentially sent vaccines up there and you can see they're upwards of around half of the population vaccinated. So we really are making progress, even if sometimes it doesn't feel like we are. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's go through the vaccines themselves to help you understand what the differences are between them. So an mRNA vaccine is like a most wanted poster that tells your body how to recognize COVID-19. It can't and it won't change your DNA. So what is an mRNA vaccine? If you start on the left-hand side here, this would be Pfizer and Moderna. So the mRNA vaccines injected into your body and mRNA cannot change your DNA. It's important to note that none of these vaccines change your genetics. None of these vaccines change your DNA. Your cells read the mRNA instructions and they start building the same kind of spike proteins that COVID-19 has. These are harmless. So we don't give you COVID. We don't give you an inactivated COVID. We don't give you a version of COVID in the vaccine, none of that. What the scientists have managed to do, which is really quite remarkable, is they've just taken a piece of the virus that's on the surface and then they give it to your body and your body makes it actually and shows it to your the immune system. So your, your immune system gets to see these spike proteins and then the mRNA dissolves. And what's been really interesting about this is a lot of the research in the last while has actually been about how do you get mRNA stable enough, it's so fragile, it has to be stabilized to actually get it into the body. So we wrap it in this kind of special fatty blanket called a nanoparticle lipid layer. Uh, it's just like a, it's almost like a helmet that goes around it so you can actually get it into the body. We freeze it at these crazy cold temperatures to actually transport it. And then when we can finally get into the body, it's there along enough to have your cells make some of these spike proteins and then it goes away because it's not it's not strong enough to stick around. If you've had a steak or some meat, you've eaten some mRNA. It's what bodies use to make proteins. It's completely normal and natural. So it's really, really quite something. On number three, your immune system sees these spike proteins and starts building a defense and then launch, launches an attack. Uh, so this is the point at which you might feel some fatigue, aches, or a fever. This is just your immune system learning to recognize the spike protein. And now your body can recognize COVID-19 spike protein and fight COVID-19 effectively, and you're now immune. Now, something I wanna kind of highlight here is that the, the interesting part about this research is the woman who did a lot of this research who ended up working at BioNTech in Germany is actually turning her attention to cancer. Um, there's also a lot of folks who are, are looking at these vaccines for research, uh, for vaccines against HIV, um, Ebola, Zika virus, flu. So this is really the kind of beginning of what we're hoping is a whole new uh, way of approaching a lot of these conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So there's two mRNA vaccines approved for emergency authorization in Canada. The first is the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. The second is Moderna. Both are two doses. They're 0 and 21 and 0 and 28 day doses because you get these two doses. Now, this is a big point of controversy right now in Canada because as many of you know, we've delayed that second dose. This, I would expect this to just keep an eye on it. it. It'll probably go back and forth for a bit. For example, we might see people over the age of 80 get their second dose sooner or 65. We're not really sure. We're waiting for research on this. What's important to know though here is that zero and 21 days is actually very close together for a second shot. 21 days and 21 eight days weren't picked because that's the best time for a second dose. It's because that was the fastest way to get the trials done in a pandemic that was killing millions of people, that they had to get these vaccines out. So they knew that they could squish it together at the absolute most zero and 21 days. Now the question is, what's the best time to actually give that second dose? And so that's why I say that science in real time, keep an eye on it. Don't, don't be surprised if these numbers change. Pfizer was, uh, if you look there, for, so Pfizer was approved for 16 and older. That's why in some places they're actually vaccinating down to the age of 16. And yesterday we just saw a, a press release that they finished the trial in ages 12 to 16. So we're hoping that means by the summer, we should be seeing younger people, you know, ages 12 to 16 teenagers actually eligible for vaccines. They've started the trials, uh, Moderna announced it maybe two weeks ago, from the ages of six months and up. So we're hoping by the summer, we'll see these vaccines available to children who are younger as well. Next slide. 
So the thing to note here is when we're often asked this, how effective are they? Well, they're both about 95% effective. And that was the shock because this was the first mRNA vaccine we've actually had approved and brought to market. Remarkably effective. Respiratory illnesses are really hard to vaccinate against. That's why the flu shot every year has been eh, mediocre, right? And we're, we're all kind of frustrated with this. This actually is a sign that this might be a better technology for respiratory viruses, which is great. And what this efficacy means, which is important to note, is that this protects you from any symptoms uh, of the illness. 95% of people are protected from severe illness, hospitalization and death, which is fabulous, but also from any symptoms. So this is coming up. I'm, I'm watching the headlines, watching how reporters report on this, where we're, we're seeing, for example, some positive cases in long-term care homes where people are actually fully immunized. But you have to read the article to note People might be testing positive, but they're not spreading it. That, that seems to be one of the things that's coming up. And they're having mild illness, or even in people in long-term care, they're asymptomatic. And they test them once, and they're positive, and then they go back and test them again, and they're negative. So that's actually that 5%, when they say 95% protection, 5% may actually still get COVID. But these all these vaccines actually seem to protect from severe illness, hospitalization and death, even if you test positive. So those aren't failures. Those stories are actually really remarkable successes and they seem to hold across age groups, which is pretty incredible. Next slide. So there's another question is what about studies and those are perfect conditions. What about the real world? Well, there's some really good research coming out of Israel because Israel's ahead of the world in vaccinating that shows about two to three weeks after your first dose of a vaccine, an mRNA vaccine like Pfizer, there's about half of people are already protected against asymptomatic infection, symptomatic, so you know, testing positive and not having symptoms or testing positive and having symptoms. But the bigger numbers there are hospitalization, severe illness and death, and that is all we care about. The asymptomatic infection and mild symptoms is just a bad cold year. You know, oh, I got a terrible cold. That's all that means. No one cares about that. A pandemic, it doesn't shut down the global economy because it's a bad cold year. What shuts down the economy is hospitalization, severe illness, and death. So within three to four weeks of having your first dose, if you look at those last three outcomes, you're actually getting up around 80% of people are already protected after one dose three to four weeks later against hospitalization, severe illness, and death. And after that second dose, your numbers are getting up around 90%, which is pretty incredible. Next slide. So what about allergies? Because this is the thing that worries a lot of people. Oh, I have allergies. I have food allergies. I've had a, an allergic reaction to penicillin in the past. Can I get this? Absolutely. People who have allergies in general to anything from cats to penicillin can absolutely be vaccinated with these vaccines. But, and as I'll bring up a little bit later, if you have a known allergy to one of the ingredients, so not allergies in general, but a known allergy to a specific ingredient that is in these vaccines, then we wouldn't give you that. But that's extremely unusual. So with allergies, we're watching these closely. They, they seem to be a bit higher. So with a flu shot, you might get an anaphylactic allergy reaction, a severe allergy reaction, one in a million. This one, it might be somewhere around five in a million. So it's still extremely uncommon, but it's possible. So we watch it closely. So what that means, if you come to our vaccine clinic, for example, if you tell the, the person injecting you that you have any allergies in the past, you're allergic to cats, you're allergic to penicillin, you've had a reaction to the flu shot, everybody waits 15 minutes, but you'll wait 30. And we just keep you a bit longer to watch just in case because we're really good at managing allergies and all to, and all the cases when these are happening the outcomes have been good when people are monitored well next slide okay so that's mrna vaccines pfizer and moderna let's shift now to the viral vector vaccines this would be astrazeneca and johnson and johnson so viral vector vaccines use a safe virus to carry some of the genes of the COVID virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, to teach the body how to recognize it. So in the same way we have with the mRNA vaccines, like a, a most wanted poster, this one puts that most wanted poster, folds it up and puts it in an envelope. And it, the, the safe virus is the envelope or briefcase or whatever analogy you wanna to use to get the, into the body that way. Next slide. So if we start on the first one here, 
Scientists make a harmless adenovirus that delivers a short genetic code to your cells and your body destroys the adenovirus, like the envelope or the backpack or whatever you want to call it. Your body gets rid of it. The genetic code tells your cells to build the same kind of spike protein that COVID-19 has. And just like the other vaccines, this cannot change your DNA. So what do I mean when I'm saying adenovirus? Adenoviruses commonly cause colds and other mild symptoms. Certain ones were chosen for this vaccine delivery job because they're modified so they can't infect humans. So the AstraZeneca vaccine uses a modified chimpanzee cold virus because we don't get chimpanzee colds. Chimpanzees don't give colds to us. And then they also tweak it just to make sure it can't spread in your body. It doesn't make you sick. You can't give it to other people. It's really just an envelope. The Johnson & Johnson uses a modified human cold virus. Same thing, that it's modified so it can't actually make you sick or be spread. Your body then sees the new spike proteins and starts building a defense and launches an attack. You may feel fatigue, aches, or fever at this point. It's your immune system learning, just like with the other one, and your body can now recognize the COVID-19 spike protein and fight off COVID-19 effectively. You're immune. So this one is not the first approved viral vector vaccine, actually. The first approved viral vector vaccine is the Ebola virus vaccine. So the Ebola virus vaccine that we would have heard about with the Ebola virus outbreak a couple of years back is a viral vector vaccine. This is also being researched significantly for treatment in cancer. So we'll probably see a lot more come up around viral vectors in the future. Next slide. So there's two approved in Canada. There's the AstraZeneca Oxford one, which just loves a headline. It can't seem to keep itself out of the news. And the Johnson & Johnson, which we're hoping we get in the next month. The big difference here is AstraZeneca is a two dose, like the mRNA vaccines, but you've got a bit more leeway on that second dose. Johnson & Johnson is the only one dose vaccine. And for a lot of reasons, we really need a vaccine like that. The, the other difference here is whereas we, we preserved the other, the mRNA vaccines by freezing them and all those kinds of things, these ones are a lot more like flu shots and that we can transport them easily. They go in a fridge. Once I have a vial, I can use that vial for 48 hours to pull doses out. But like it's, uh, these vaccines, as much as they love a headline, are much, much, much easier to use. You don't need as big of a team to get them across. You can give them anywhere. We've even seen stories too of using drones to transport them into rural locations. The Pfizer and Moderna, I can't shake it. Uh, if I drop a vial, I have to throw it out. Uh, this one, I could throw it across the room, pick it up and still use it and it's fine. So it, it's much more robust vaccine, a much more realistic vaccine. And that's why you see governments really still pushing. We would really like to use this vaccine because they're great vaccines. Next slide. So how effective are they? This is the big question that we get. Should I wait for an mRNA vaccine because it's more effective? You have to be very careful with a question like that because these vaccines do have efficacy of somewhere in the 60 to 70 range for any symptomatic illness. So about two thirds to three quarters of people who get the AstraZeneca or the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be prevented from even getting a mild cold from COVID. However, about a third to you know, thereabouts, a, a third to a quarter of the population who get these vaccines might get a mild cold when they get sick, just like we're seeing in the news. But these vaccines have almost 100% protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Again, the things that make this a pandemic, these vaccines are extremely, extremely effective for. They are as good as the mRNA vaccines. Now, we and so people think of these as less effective. They aren't necessarily less effective. They're actually excellent vaccines that are much easier to use. Again, there's just a lot of communication stuff that, that's kind of muddied the waters around them. Next slide. So this is an interesting study. A preprint is a study that's not gone through peer review yet where the researchers, you know, it's timely, it needs to go out, it's going through peer review. So they post it and people can look at, you know, get almost like a preview of it when the final paper is going to come out later. So this was an interesting one that, that came out of maybe three, four weeks ago now, where they looked in Scotland where they've had pretty good, you know, the UK has done a great job vaccinating. They had Pfizer and AstraZeneca. They looked at 5 billion people who had been vaccinated and they asked how effective is one dose at preventing hospitalization. And what they found is that the effectiveness peaks 
four to five weeks after that first dose. Pfizer reached an effectiveness of about 85% and AstraZeneca reached an effectiveness of about 94%. So again, when people think of effectiveness of Pfizer and AstraZeneca, and they think the mRNA vaccines are better. I want that Pfizer vaccine. I want that Moderna vaccine. That is actually usually people not understanding that what we really care about is severe illness, hospitalization and death. And that's why people say, don't wait for a vaccine. Don't wait for what you think of as a better vaccine. We're often asked, you know, which one should I choose? That's not often what's being offered. The first vaccine that you can get of the ones approved in Canada is the one most likely to protect you from severe illness, hospitalization and death. And this is critical as we start to hear about more reports out of British Columbia for, or Alberta, I guess it was, about COVID with the variant spreading outdoors for the first time. These are very, very contagious. These variants are very contagious. You're, you need to think about getting the first vaccine that you can get in a pandemic, in a third wave with very contagious variants. It, it's not about choosing vaccines. It's about choosing the earliest point at which you can get vaccinated. Next slide. So what are the reasons you would not get one of these vaccines? Well, the first one is previously confirmed allergy to one of the COVID vaccines. So if you have an allergic reaction to Pfizer the first time, we wouldn't give it to you the second time or to one of the ingredients. So the ingredients that we, we worry about, for example, are something called polyethylene glycol or PEG. Uh, if you've had a colonoscopy and drank that four liter jug that you know cleans you out, that's polyethylene glycol. If you've had Laxadair Restorolax, that's polyethylene glycol. A lot of gel caps like Benadryl gel caps, um, uh, ibuprofen, like Advil, have polyethylene glycol in them. It's common ingredients, allergies to them are very rare. If you do have an allergy to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate, we wouldn't give you this vaccine, we'd give you another one. We, we'd say well, maybe that's a great AstraZeneca one for you then. The other three are not so much about safety as effectiveness. So people who have symptoms of confirmed or suspected COVID infection should wait until they feel better just so that your immune system is ready for the vaccine. If you're acutely ill, this is any vaccine. If you've got a fever, if you've got an infection, you're getting antibiotics for not a bit of sniffles, but you know, an actual infection that you're really fighting off, you just wait until you're better before we vaccinate you. And people who have had another vaccine in the last 14 days, again, we don't, because these are new vaccines, we don't want to complicate things by having, you know, you got shingles a few days ago, and then you got this one, the shingles vaccine, and then this one, and, you know, you got side effects, well, which one caused it? So we separate them. We also want to make sure your immune system is ready for a vaccine, um, that, you know, nothing's complicating it. Next slide, please. So what about side effects? What should I remember about the side effects of these vaccines? Well, about eight in 10 people complain of a sore arm, but only one in a hundred call that soreness severe. The most similar vaccines in terms of side effects to these ones would be the shingles vaccine, gives you a really sore arm, and the tetanus vaccine. If you've had a tetanus shot, often you're quite sore afterwards. It's very similar. These are very similar. About five in 10 people complain of fatigue or headache, but only one in 10 need Advil or Tylenol. The side effects are the result of an expected immune response to the vaccine, and most are mild and easily managed at home. Next slide. Okay, so the big question is, what about those blood clots with AstraZeneca? That's what's been in the news. So before I, I really get into that, I need to just set some context. One, in, one to two people per thousand Canadians have a blood clot each year. So it's actually quite, quite common. Those with COVID in particular, who end up in hospital, one in 20 people who are hospitalized with COVID develop a blood clot. COVID causes a lot of blood clots. And actually what makes COVID so hard to manage and what makes it different than a regular bad cold season or flu season often is the blood clots. Early on presenting symptoms for younger people who had COVID were strokes. They were coming in with strokes and that's when they were realizing that they had COVID. COVID causes clots. One in a hundred people who, who get COVID, who don't even, who aren't sick enough to be in hospital, but who just get COVID are ex suspected of having, um, are estimated to be getting clots as well. If this AstraZeneca vaccine is in fact causing this very rare condition uh, where it, it's a very special kind of a blood clot condition, uh, at most right now, it seems to be about one in 250,000. And as you're probably hearing on the news, especially for younger people, the variants are spreading like crazy. 
a lot are ending up in ICU and there's an awful lot of clots going on with that. So we need to be careful that we keep in mind that this clots are just a new reality for us right now. And there isn't a, a clear connection between this suspected condition and the vaccine. We're, we're not 100% sure that it is actually the vaccine causing it. Um, so there's a lot of debate and controversy. So one of the things that Thrombosis Canada, that the blood clot experts in Canada has said is keep in mind that COVID has killed over 15,000 Canadians so far, that about one in 100 Canadians who get COVID-19 end up needing intensive care, and that one in five Canadians who are hospitalized with COVID-19 develop blood clots. Currently, Canada is experiencing a third wave of COVID-19. This condition, these, these vaccine-induced blood clots are very rare, while the AstraZeneca vaccine has proven effective at reducing severe illness from COVID-19. Healthcare professionals, scientists, and government agencies in Ontario and around the world continue to monitor the safety of this in all vaccines. Next slide, please. So as your immune system learns from COVID, remember, you might feel tired, you might have a bit of a headache, achy, uh, chills and a low fever. You're feeling slightly bad for a short time as you build immunity for a long time. This is more likely to happen when you're younger. Uh, this is more likely to happen with the second dose. Next slide. So these are the most common questions that we're getting. The first is, well, how do these vaccines come out so quickly? The thing to know about this is vaccine research is slow, not because it should be slow, but because we don't fund it well. As we're all living through in Canada, we don't manufacture vaccines in Canada. That has slowed down our process and our ability to do trials. The people who have been researching coronavirus vaccines for years have been saying, we've been trying to develop a vaccine to SARS and to MERS. We couldn't get money to, no one would fund us to build these vaccines until the pandemic happened. All of a sudden, all these companies, countries, the world invested crazy amounts of resources, time, money, you had private jets picking up samples and flying them to other places to start manufacturing. They were willing to risk a lot. And in Pfizer is a great story where they said, we're just going to start making it. And if the trials work, we've got supply. And if they don't, we'll throw them out and it's a loss. That doesn't happen in a normal time. That's why this happened so fast. As well, the mRNA vaccines are much faster to make, which is great for future you know, promise around things like flu shots. We've already talked about the fact that none of these vaccines change your DNA. And as far as are the ingredients safe, um, we've talked about a lot of the ingredients. It's also worth noting, these vaccines are generally considered to be preservative free. We preserve them by freezing them and by using pH to regulate them. There are no blood products in any of these vaccines. There are no fetal cells in any of these vaccines. There are no animal products in any of these vaccines, no pork, nothing like that. And what kind of long-term data do we still need? Th this is the one that people will get, okay, I feel great, but what about, what if something goes wrong a year from now and we all got this? So the thing to know about vaccines and side effects are the side effects tend to show up within two to three days after a vaccine. Sore arm, all that kind of stuff. That's normal. Rarely, and just like after an infection, a viral infection, like a flu or a cold, rarely you might get a, a rare neurologic reaction, something like Guillain-Barre. You may have heard of Guillain-Barre or even experienced it yourself. The things like the flu, and it can cause that. And so, you know, like with the flu, it's about 10 in a million people get that rare neurological condition, but one in a million would get it from the vaccine. So we know the vaccine can cause it, but we know the virus can cause it. And so it's a trade-off. So we're always with vaccine research. We're watching for about six weeks after a vaccine to make sure those rare things have not shown up. So they've done that and that's what the trials have shown. Now what we're seeing is this kind of long-term real-time monitoring the, the blood clot, is the system working itself through? Okay, some people reported it. We have to figure out, is it a coincidence? Is it a real side effect? We don't know. Really robust systems are tracking this. Scientists around the world are looking at it. McMaster's looking at developing a, a test for antibodies against you know, platelets around AstraZeneca vaccine, all that kind of stuff. So scientists are, are really quickly working through these things. But that's, it's not so much a safety, a long-term safety question, Could even that reaction showed up within a few days. So there's not long-term side effects that we're looking at. What we're looking at long-term is how long do these vaccines work? How long does one dose last? How long does two doses last? With the variants, do you need a booster in a year? Do you need a booster in five years? If you get this, does it protect you from being contagious? We think it does, but that's a long-term question that needs to be answered. So long-term data actually is about effectiveness, not about safety. Next slide. 
So for the viral vector vaccines, again, we've gone through these, how they work. It uses the safe virus that your body can get rid of. The ingredients are very safe. We've talked about how these vaccines are extremely effective, AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, for severe illness, hospitalization, and death, the only things that really matter with COVID. And long-term data, it's the same. We need to know how long does one or two doses last, and do we need boosters for the uh, variants as well. Next slide. So let's talk about building vaccine confidence and you and people around you. We hear a lot, I will say at the vaccine clinic, I have had so many people come in and say, my adult children, you know, my son's in his forties and he told me, mom, don't go and get those vaccines. They're not safe. You know, I got my sister to drive me because I'm gonna get vaccinated. He doesn't understand. And I think sometimes that, you know, it, the onus is really going to be on the, the first groups vaccinated, seniors on the way down to build confidence in the generations that follow them to show and to lead by example, I got it and I'm fine, you can get it too. So I, I've, that was unexpected for me. I've been really surprised by that. Next slide. So concerns and denial are natural and normal. We need to, to recognize they don't stem from ignorance. They often stem from anxiety or fear. Uh, next slide. So what we need to focus on is, you know, there's people who just say, yep, I'll get the vaccine. They accept the vaccine first time they're offered. People who have some questions that just need to be answered. People are hesitating who, you know, especially family doctors and pharmacists can help them actually get comfortable. And then there's people who are truly anti-vaccine and, and that's a completely separate issue, but they're actually a very small proportion of the population. So the big questions people often have is, does it work? And as I've just shown you, these vaccines are extremely effective for severe illness, hospitalization and death, exactly what we need to end the pandemic. They're safe. We're tracking rare side effects. You, you're getting to watch the system in real time, which is I think wonderful for a lot of people to know. We do this for every drug. We are always doing this. And also knowing people think they're not at risk, but with the variants right now, what we're hearing in hospitals, people are coming in and getting intubated and they're saying, I had no idea that I went a whole year and I didn't get sick. And how could I have gotten sick now? So we are absolutely at risk, absolutely in this third wave. So focusing on the idea that they work and they're safe, there is risk to us, but also this is the way out of the pandemic. Next slide. And what you can see is in July, when we started asking Canadians about vaccines before there was a vaccine, only about half of people here actually thought they wanted the vaccine. You know, as we got into the fall, where it's still not much of an idea, it dropped to about 40%. But in November, when we started getting news about Pfizer in December, when we we're getting Moderna and into January, when they were actually getting into the arms of people, we're seeing confidence actually increase. And we're hoping that this continues to increase as more and more people get vaccinated. Next slide. So if you got the vaccine, be proud and make it public. This is a slide we made for healthcare providers, but people are more likely to get the vaccine if their healthcare provider also got it. I suspect you have a lot of influence on your friends and family around you as well. So if you got it, put it on Facebook, tell them, tell your kids, tell your friends, tell everybody around you that you got it to help boost confidence. And I'm gonna end with this last slide just to show you, this is just, this is all the vaccines that are being researched around the world right now all sorts of different mRNA vaccines, viral vector, protein subunit, and the old fashioned inactivated virus vaccines. Loads of research. This is probably the most research on any single condition going on at a single time in, the history, in, in our history for vaccines for sure. So really it's a, a, a hopeful time and a promising optimistic time as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grinrod. You're answering so many of the questions I'm sure many of our viewers have, and it's very uh, convincing and easy to see why we should be so confident in these vaccines. So thank you very much for that. As we transition to Dr. Sharon Ball, I'd like to invite you again at home to please uh, share your questions uh, that we might answer at the end of the session. So Dr. Ball. Okay, I'm just gonna set my timer, make sure I keep it around 15 minutes or a bit less. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide. So I'm going to uh, just provide an overview of the provincial prioritization and what you've probably heard are phases. So phase one, phase two, and phase three. And what does that mean and where are we? Uh, we're going to look at vaccine delivery in Waterloo Region as an example, and, and, and this is probably applicable to many regions. So we'll talk about the five types of clinics and how we get to our goal of 10,000 doses a day or beyond. And then hopefully for uh, the guests today, hot off the press, how this actually affects uh, older adults and caregivers in the community. Next slide. 
So this is a provincial place map, which of course is outdated and vaccine uh, science, everything is outdated. Um, but really the purpose of showing this slide is just to look at the phase one, phase two and phase three buckets. Uh, we were expecting to be in phase one from uh, really December till March, and then really phase two, April to the end of July. And then once we had a study supply, we would be in phase three. What uh, is true across both of our public health units is we're certainly registering and vaccinating people into phase two. So we continue to do our phase one, but we're certainly into the, the first uh, priority populations in phase two already. And hopefully by June, we'll have, in, we're hoping vaccine supply dependent have been able to provide the vaccine uh, to everyone who wants it in terms of their first dose. Next slide. So many of you are familiar with the phase one groups that were able to pre-register and many of whom have already been vaccinated, but again, are, are still eligible to be vaccinated. Those are our Indigenous adults, our long-term care home and retirement home, residents, staff and essential caregivers, our predominantly senior congregate settings and apartments. <clears throat> adult recipients of chronic home care. We were delighted when uh, phase one actually opened up to 80 years and older in the community. That was initially in phase two, so that was really wonderful. And of course, our healthcare workers have been part of phase one. Next slide. So this is a slide from the very first day and the very first dose uh, of uh, Pfizer that was delivered in Waterloo Region. So we actually had Pfizer land in our freezer at Grand River Hospital, December 21st, uh, frozen solid. And the next day, December 22nd, we had our first vaccine clinic. And it was lovely because this is actually a clinic that was in the hospital in Kitchener, but you see there are primary care nurse, Teresa McConnell, actually my nurse in Cambridge, uh, who uh, delivered the very first vaccine to a long-term care worker in Elmira. And if you think about that, primary care, hospital, long-term care, <clears throat> the, uh, the community, the hospital, I think that that just kind of gives you a sense of how regional this effort has been. Next slide. And this was a day of pure joy. So um, I actually got this picture from Dr. Shuli Wong, who I think herself was in tears. It was a Saturday. And this is Marcy. So we had had our 80 and over pre-registration a day or two before. And Marcy at 105 on a Saturday got her vaccine uh, at the Grand River Hospital Clinic. And she was just excited. She was dressed up. She brought a nice blinged out cane, which accompanied her very sparkling personality. And just to know that in the community, our most vulnerable were getting their vaccine was uh, I think so impactful for all of us. Next slide. So we're going to talk about clinic strategy. So when you do look at your drop down menus, hopefully this will start making a little bit more sense to you. So in the region here, we have five types of clinics because we got Pfizer delivered in our vaccines. Uh, we had originally a hospital clinic. The moment we were given permission to move Pfizer, we could take the vaccine out to those that were the most vulnerable in long-term care homes and retirement homes. And that started our second modality, the mobile clinics. The way of thinking about mobile is where, when is it appropriate to bring the vaccine out to the person when the person's not really able to get to the vaccine? And you can see a few other priority groups there. Um, our public health clinics are our third type of clinic. And so we've got the large one at Boardwalk and we have another large one at Pinebush in Cambridge. And those are staffed by a variety of different uh, folks. We have mid-sized clinics, uh, which are team-based primary care clinics. So an example of that is the one that's being hosted at University of Waterloo Pharmacy with the Center for Family Medicine Kitchener. Another example is the one that's in Wellesley and of course at Langs. And that is really where you can go into a primary care setting and get your vaccine. And finally, smaller sites. We always knew that once we got more vaccine, more fridge stable vaccine, we could go into lots of different offices, offices like mine that have five doctors uh, and people can actually see their own family physician or their own nurse to get their vaccine. Next slide. And so this uh, is an example, and uh, you don't need to focus on the numbers except the total lines, but it is really looking at how the mobile and on-site clinics were able to be done more easily once we got Moderna, which is a little bit more portable, 
how the mass immunization sites will probably continue having uh, Pfizer, the team-based sites will probably have a mix of Pfizer and Moderna, and of course the pharmacies and uh, primary care settings will really rely on those fridge-stable vaccines, um, Moderna and, and likely AstraZeneca. And you can see how we're really aiming our capacity to be more than 12,000 a day at maturity. And so we really have been in this situation of moving from scarcity um, at the, the new year to a ramp up phase in March and April so that when we do get a lot of vaccine supply, April, May, June, we are just ready to go. And this uh, slide gives you an example of some different clinic locations. So with what I've said, you know, we have the boardwalk, which is a large sort of mass immunization or a larger immunization site. We have those primary care examples of Langs and Health Sciences and Wellesley, another big site at Pine Bush, a couple of indigenous community led sites at culturally safe locations, and then a smaller family health organization in Elmira. And if you look at the start dates, that's really what I want to highlight, that March has been a busy time for us to stand up all of these clinics. So right now, uh, and this is part of our plan, we have much, much more capacity uh, than we actually do vaccine. And that's exactly where we want to be anticipating that vaccine is coming to us. And so this essentially says the same thing. We're ramping up capacity, but I just want to make the point that we're also taking feedback. So feedback from residents and uh, who come to get vaccinated, from volunteers, from staff, always trying to improve our processes, trying to be as patient-centered as possible while we really look at that ramp up in the next month or two. This is an example for me when I was thinking through sort of if you look on the left at the top, phase one, which was in the hospital, phase two, which moved out into mobile and primary care, and phase three, which really involves um, mass immunization clinics, primary care and pharmacy, that's really where huge population immunization strategy should be. And that's really where we're going to, going to be moving more and more into the community. And so for uh, this audience, I think it's really important to talk about phase two and what that means for all of you. So firstly, uh, it's been over a week that we've opened up our pre-registration to uh, community dwelling seniors 70 and older, and just a couple of days ago to 60 and older. And that's certainly uh, the case in uh, Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph, where they're um, registering the same age groups. And so for those who are 59 right now, as long as you turn 60, uh, sometime this year, you are eligible. Common question we get. Next slide. And we've also looked at medical conditions. So there are some medical conditions that make you higher risk if you do get COVID. Uh, there's highest, high risk, and at risk. Right now we're focused on the highest risk and high risk to be pre-registered and they're eligible to get their vaccine. And you can see these are really high risk conditions like transplant, blood malignancies, bone marrow transplant, certain neurologic diseases, and fairly impaired kidney function. And high risk conditions involve morbid obesity, being on really strong immunosuppressants that will um, affect your immune system. And there's a couple of examples there, as well as intellectual and developmental disabilities. So while these people right now are, are absolutely welcome to pre-register and are getting vaccinated, I just wanted to highlight that for each of these people in our community, one essential caregiver um, if you're providing support uh, for a daily living, you are also eligible for pre-registration. And you don't have to link your pre-registration. It's sort of an independent process. Um, we have enlisted family doctors, community specialists to reach out to patients, to search through their medical records, send notifications to patients so that they know that they're eligible, but you do not need a note or anything to prove that uh, you qualify. Next slide. Faith leaders as well who provide pastoral care, whether it's in settings like uh, retirement homes or the hospital, or it's straight in your home who provide palliative care or other visits on well persons, they are also eligible to uh, get the vaccine and they're being pre-registered right now. And this is a large group. And this is actually uh, another group that's in phase two that's eligible for uh, pre-registering. 
Most of these you can see are congregate settings. So people are under one roof. And as a result, likely the vaccine will be coming to them. So likely this will be largely done through mobile clinics. For example, a Sunbeam has been hosting pop-up clinics for those who are getting services through developmental services. Um, our emergency homeless shelters, we're working with Langs and Sanguine, uh, and you can see other um, congregate settings there. Next slide. I did want to highlight, though, for a subset of those um, high-risk congregate settings, the essential caregiver for a resident can also get vaccinated. So for each of those, one essential caregiver is actually eligible for vaccination. I think that's a really important point, and you can just see that right on our drop-down menu. So one very important question, and I got asked this from patients, is, well, you're doing the long-term care home and retirement homes and going out to them. And we understand that seniors in the community are being prioritized, but what about the ones who actually can't get to a vaccination clinic? How about our housebound seniors? It's a really important population. Next slide. And certainly when people are able, when they can get some support from a loved one, uh, when they can get some assistance with transportation, of course, they are welcome and encouraged to attend our vaccination clinics. But for residents who are homebound, who do not leave their home for personal, medical, or social reasons, of course, we want to make sure we get your vaccine to you as well. And now with Moderna, we are able to do that a little bit more easily. We wouldn't really have been able to do it with Pfizer. So uh, that is actually on our Region of Waterloo website. We also send a communication to all the primary care physicians and nurse practitioners in the community to say, if you can think of a few people on your roster who you know are homebound, can you please let them know this information? Because we are able to actually have um, part of our mobile team come out. It's quite slow, slogging through it. I think they do 20 immunizations a day, but it is an important service. And last uh, couple of slides is really just to highlight our dashboard. Um, I know that Wellington Dufferin Guelph and Dr. Mercer have an amazing uh, dashboard and, uh, and uh, a website as well. Um, our dashboard here shows we're almost 82,000 vaccines administered. And if you look at that blue slope on the bottom, boy, we are just going up and up and up. And that's really what we're wanting to do. So right now we've got uh, over 11% of our eligible population vaccinated and ready to do lots more. Next slide. And so the last slide is really just uh, the fact that my parents are quite uh, desperate to see their grandchildren. They got vaccinated last Monday. And so I think this just harkens back to the fact that it looks like we have those trials are, uh, proving uh, efficacy and safety for 12 up. And, and again, much more, uh, much more research to be done. So hopefully we can reunite families at some point. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Ball. And thank you for the profound leadership you're showing in the rollout of the vaccine in our area. Uh, we'd like, now like to welcome uh, Kylie Anderson uh, from Wellington Dufferin Guelph, Public Health. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here today. Um, I was just asked to speak uh, very briefly about um, who's eligible to register in Wellington Dufferin Guelph and how to go about that. Um, so I don't need to go into, I don't think, these phase one and phase two groups, as that was already covered um, really nicely. Um, but I will just say that um, we do have um, our pre-registration open for our COVID-19 uh, vaccine appointment booking. So um, we have immediate appointment availability for those in the phase one groups. Um, and we're also vaccinating and booking appointments for um, a number of people in the phase two groups as well, as was mentioned. Um, so I can get into uh, a little bit more detail about what our pre register actually if you just go back one second, sorry a little bit more information of what to expect when you pre-register. So when you go to our website, wdgpublichealth.ca slash register, um, it will show you the eligible priority groups. When you click the link to pre-register, um, what you're doing is you're putting your information and you are going to then receive a code um, either by email or by text to then, um, you'll have a unique code and you'll use this code and the link to actually book your appointment. So the pre-registration is getting everybody in our system and when it's your turn and there's um, uh, an appointment available, we will connect with you through the email or phone and that's when you can then go and book your appointment. So some people are expecting to receive notification immediately. Um, some people, depending on where you are in our system, it could take 
four to six weeks um, to actually book an appointment. Uh, but having said that, everyone in phase one, there's an, um, there's an immediate availability for appointments. And we're also booking appointments for those who are 65 and older right now. So we're really, we're really going through those um, priority groups. Um, as well as certain individuals with um, health conditions um, and for those caregivers as well, um, they can expect um, to, to potentially wait around two to three weeks or so. So you might not get an appointment immediately, but we are going through those um, quite quickly. Um, so next slide, please. So if you don't have an email or a cell phone number, we do have um, a a booking line, which you can see the number here. And you can also call this booking line if you do need help with pre-registration or for booking your appointments. We've just increased our capacity for this line, um, which is really great. It's now a live answer from uh, Monday to Saturday from 12 to eight. Um, our wait time is down. It's, it's, um, it's actually, we've increased the capacity and it's going really well for this booking line right now. Um, so if you um, are having any issues pre-registering or booking, please feel free to call this line. Um, and I just wanted to touch base on, again, I'm just talking about our public health clinics, um, our main clinics. We also have mobile clinics and other vaccines in the community, as was mentioned. Um, but we do have a number of main clinic locations in Wellington, Denver, and Guelph, including four sites in Guelph. We have Fergus, uh, Drayden, Mount Forest, and Palmerston clinics. And I just wanted to highlight that our website has a lot of information on it. So if you're looking to find out about the status of vaccinations in Wellington, Dufferin or Guelph, we have a, a lot of um, Q&A on our website, which is really great. You can check out. We have information on how to prepare for your vaccine, um, how to pre-register and book appointments, and also um, the locations of our clinics. So if you go to our website, um, wdgpublichealth.ca slash vaccine, uh, you can find all that information there. Thanks so much, Kylie. Uh, and now we'll welcome uh, Fazia to bring some information from the region of Waterloo. Hi everyone, thank you. And so you got a lot of information. It's very similar for region of Waterloo as it was for Wellington, Dufferin and Guelph. So this will make it even easier. So for pre-registration in, in region of Waterloo, we also have a link. It's the same format that was just covered where you go on that link. If you're a part of a priority group, you put in the information and then you receive um, contact either through your mobile phone or through your email or text when there's a booking uh, appointment ready for you. And you then go in with the code and book that appointment. Next slide. So on our pre-registration webpage, this is what it looks like. There'll be a really big green button there. We also put a video there. Um, if you want support in what that would look like and how to actually pre-register, there's a short video there that a lot of people have found helpful to review. Next slide. Um, all of this I think was covered at, in, in, the, in the presentation. One thing to know is that on the day of your vaccination, we ask that you bring some form of ID that you not arrive any more than 10 minutes earlier. And you can bring one person to support you at the appointment um, if you'd like and to wear something comfortable, really. The other thing I want to show you is that on our website, again, the, the, web, the, the, the link is there. We have all of our maps for our main sites. And this is just an example of one at the boardwalk. And it'll show you where the parking is, what the major intersection is, what the building looks like, what the accessibility features like. So if you want to find out in advance of going, it's really great resource set up on our website to show you all of the, the information related to each of our fixed sites, our main sites for, for vaccination. Next slide. And again, for most up-to-date information on COVID-19 vaccines, I really suggest that you check out um, our website uh, for Waterloo Region. It's where you get all of the updates in terms of who is eligible for pre-registration. There's a ton of FAQs there. A lot of these um, recordings for these information sessions are also there. Um, so I would suggest that you, know, you would take a look at that as well. Well, thank you, Fazia, and done in great, great time, folks. We, we don't have any questions um, from our participants today, unfortunately, but that just probably speaks to the fact that you did such an excellent job in your presentations. I know uh, these four women have been working full tilt around the clock 
um, sharing, uh, sharing sessions like this with different communities and populations and uh, their, their tireless efforts are appreciated as is their chance to come uh, by and meet with us today. Uh, we, we so much appreciate this. So from this point forward, um, you will receive a, a copy of the recording of this presentation uh, next week. Immediately following this, this uh, session, you'll receive an email that asks you to participate in a very short survey and evaluation. Uh, but I'd like to thank you at home very much for being with us today for our first knowledge exchange of the Waterloo Wellington Older Adult Strategy and encourage you to follow us on Twitter at WW Older Adults. But I'd very much like to thank our presenters, Kelly, Sharon, uh, Fazia, and Kylie for being with us today and for their outstanding work in our communities. So with that, uh, we'll bid you a fine day and a wonderful long weekend. And uh, thank you again for joining us. Do take care, everyone, and please be safe.